One summer, when I was a kid, I had a genius for a friend. Perhaps friend is a strong word. Dimitri was simply the boy my age who lived in the house behind mine. But a genius he absolutely was. Dimitri loved strategy games. First, we played chess, and when he grew bored of beating me in that, we played the Pokemon card game, then Magic the Gathering, then Warhammer 40k, using the meager armies we could afford, of course. I never won any of these games, save for one time that Dimitri didn't realize I had to discard only one fire energy from Nine Tails to attack, not two like Charizard. Dimitri was a master of both science and the humanities, even at his absurdly young age. His room was filled with books about relativity and military history. He claimed his dad was a scientist who worked for the government in Virginia, but I never met him. He lived with his mom, but I didn't see her around much either. She was usually sick with some malady or another and confined to her room. Adults were rare at Dimitri's place, so we were mostly left to play our games in the basement. When we grew sick of games, we'd venture outside to the park in our neighborhood. The park was nothing to write home about, just some rusted swings and a blue slide that always had a thin layer of water at the bottom, even if it hadn't rained in weeks. That was fine though, as we had little use for the playground equipment. We fancied ourselves adventurers and took to exploring the wood surrounding the park. Our neighborhood was always adding houses that cut into our precious wood space, but we still never seemed to run out of them. We took to mapping the woods and liked seeing how far we dared to venture each time. Dimitri handled the handwritten map as we used his superior math and geography skills to document as much as we could. One time we found a deer carcass with a dart in its skull and spent half the summer trying to solve the case of the rogue hunter. We never did. Another time we found another pile of bones that seemed suspiciously canine in nature. We never solved that case either. At the edge of the park was a huge, overturned log with one branch awkwardly sticking out at the side. Whenever one of us went into the woods without the other, I instituted the rule that we'd roll the log over so the little branch stuck up like a mailbox flag. I made sure we did the same when we went into the woods together, even though no one else knew what the overturn log meant. Then, one summer, Dimitri's family suddenly moved away. We didn't share any common friends, and I was a bit of a loner anyway, so I never really heard what he was up to. Sometimes I would ask other kids in the neighborhood about him, but they never remembered the dark-haired kid with thin glasses. Occasionally, I would recall our adventures in the woods or the times I got destroyed in magic and would google Dimitri to see what he was up to. I never found a trace of him on the internet. More than a decade after Dimitri and I had spent a summer together, he was a ghost. Then one day, he knocked on my front door. It was a couple of years after I'd graduated college and I was still living with my parents in the old neighborhood as the job market was rough and I needed to save money on rent. On Saturday, my mom and dad were out of the house running errands and I was at the kitchen table in front of my laptop applying for jobs, but in reality doing anything but that, when I heard a knock on our front door. Not a doorbell ring, a knock. When I opened the door, I laughed because I recognized him immediately. He was an adult now, of course, but he looked exactly the same. The same dark hair and even darker eyes. He had even somehow maintained the darkened outline of a peach fuzz mustache that he insisted on never shaving when we were kids. You probably don't remember me, but... Dimitri! I cried and swept him into a big hug. I was always a hugger, Dimitri was not. We chatted briefly on my front porch before I realized I should invite him in. 
at my family's kitchen table. I asked what he had been up to, and he gave some fairly expected answers. He had gone to an Ivy League school and graduated top of his class. He had somehow double majored in engineering and economics. He got a job right out of school building analytical models for some kind of stock trader in New York. Naturally, I felt pretty bad that I was talking with such a peer from my parents' kitchen table, but this was part of the course of our relationship. We were always the brilliant Dimitri and his dumbass little friend, and I honestly made peace with that. What are you doing in town? I finally got around to asking. Uh, my mom is sick, he said. This was not a big surprise as she always was. Still, this must have been a different kind of sick if he had come home from New York. I'm sorry man, is there anything I can do? No, it's fine, it's fine. My uncle has been able to help a bit. Just thought I'd pitch in, he said. In fact, that's not the only reason I came home. What else is there? I asked. I've been working on a big project, and I was hoping you could help me out with it. I was stunned. What kind of project would Dimitri need my help with? He must have sensed my confusion and panic because he added an addendum. The project is mostly finished, I'm just going to test it tomorrow, and I'd like someone there. You know, like a friend he said, looking up from the table to glance at my response. I was touched. Dimitri and I were technically friends, but I couldn't ever recall him actually acknowledging that. Whatever this project was, I was going to help him with it. Absolutely, I said. What's the project? I have to get back to my mum now, but I'll tell you about it tomorrow. Can you meet me at the park? The park? I asked. Yes, our park, 1pm, Eastern Daylight Time, he said. I told him I would. We said our brief goodbyes, and I expected him to head back home through my backyard like the good old days. But of course, he didn't live here anymore. Only I did. The next day, I walked to the park. It was less than a mile from both our houses. A straight shot right down Firelands Avenue and all the bland suburban homes that populated it. As I approached the edge of the park, I saw a big red pickup truck with the back covered parked on the street. Much to my surprise, Dimitri climbed out of it. New truck? I asked. I got it for a specific purpose, he said. Had to haul something over. So we were getting right down to it then. I didn't have time to respond before Dimitri continued right on. I've created a time machine, he said. I should have been shocked. Time travel is obviously impossible. No such thing exists. But the truth is, part of me has always expected Dimitri to tell me something exactly like I've built a time machine since the moment I first met him. Okay, I said. Good, you believe me, Dimitri said. Let me show you the machine. He opened the back of his truck and pulled out what appeared to be a long metal tube, like a tetherball pole. Once he extracted the entirety of it from the truck, he set it on the ground facing upward. I could see that it had four short curved pikes at the base so the pole could be positioned upright. I thought this might be just one component of the machine and he would assemble the rest, but he made no further movement to get anything else out of the truck. This is it? I said. This is it. How does it... Uh, how does it work? Dimitri smiled. A rarity for him. It's complicated, obviously, but I'll explain it as best as I can. Let me try to tell you everything, and if you have any questions at the end, just tell me. Dimitri didn't really bother to explain the nuts and bolts of what the machine did to send people back in time, only that it could. 
something about polarity in the Earth's cores, combined with the unique hormone he discovered. The spikes on the device were designed to be wedged into the Earth so that it didn't move as the user moved backwards through time. Time and space are inseparable, he said, and it was paramount to remain in the same space as one moved through time. The device would remain stationary while the time travelers grabbed onto the pole portion. It was then possible to travel back in time, but not forward. Interesting, I said. How far back can the time machine go? In theory, as far back as time itself goes, Dimitri said, but that would be unwise to experiment with. So it's not like a kill Hitler machine, I asked. I suppose you could go back in time and kill Hitler, he said, but that would be incredibly difficult for us to achieve. For starters, there is the spatial aspect. We could probably go back to, say, 1889, but we would still be in the woods in Ohio. Then we'd have to secure passage to Germany, and we'd inevitably begin to run into some paradoxes. Paradoxes? Yes, as far as we know, we've never existed in 1890. If my theories are correct, and they most certainly are, time abhors a paradox, just as nature abhors a vacuum. That's why I plan to time travel back to both a location and a time I'm exceedingly familiar with. Something was beginning to click in my head. I didn't know much about time travel, but I did know quite a bit about my shared history with Dimitri. You want to go back to that summer? I said. Yes, I do, Dimitri replied. I've been thinking about the past and trying to isolate the location that I spent the most time in, the location that would best minimize my risk. Aside from my child at home, which I no longer have access to, I spent the most time in my life in these woods. That's why I want to travel back to that summer and then walk around these woods. That should help limit temporal displacement. Temporal displacement? Like a time sickness. To avoid it, it's best to go back to a time you're familiar with and to recreate the conditions of the time as best you can. I will take us back to this exact time on Saturday, July 20th, 2007. The Earth should be in roughly the same position then as it is now. That should take a lot of the pressure of the machine supporting rods. My enthusiasm for time travel was beginning to wane a bit. Demetrius' genius always had my implicit trust, and if that genius said a trip back to the summer of 07 to visit the woods was safe, then it was safe. But I was also beginning to see my role in all of this. In order for Demetrius' trip to work, he needed every item and circumstance to be the way it was when he was a kid. He needed me. But did he need me as a fellow time explorer? Or a prop? In an uncharacteristic move for him, Dimitri seemed to pick up on my discomfort. And I'd like you to come back with me too, of course. Sometimes you pick up on the obvious stuff that I miss. So let me know if you think there are any paradoxes or simple time travel rules I've missed. I knew by obvious stuff, Dimitri meant stupid stuff, but I was heartened by it all the same. I remembered the Ninetales Charizard debacle fondly. I did have a tendency to pick up on the obvious stuff that he took for granted. I thought for a moment. The concept seemed to pass the idiot test. What if we see ourselves? I asked. We won't, Dimitri said. I know the day in question we're going to. We're at your house and I'm at soccer practice. But what if we do? Then we do. It's not that big of a deal. If we saw ourselves in the past, then we did already. And clearly it didn't mess us up or anything. Do you recall meeting an adult who looks just like you? I don't think so. It's like Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban rules then. Sure, it's like Harry Potter rules. There will ultimately be no damage to the time stream, but I can't guarantee that seeing your younger self won't hurt somewhat. 
Again, your brain doesn't necessarily want to be in a different, older time. You might get a hell of a headache or something. I considered the risks for a moment, then said, Let's do it. Dimitri had me leave my keys, wallet and phone in the truck. He also procured a new set of shoes for me to put on, an extremely old pair of new balances in my size. We then picked up the long machine and held either side of it. We made our way through the park, more rusted up than ever, and arrived at the edge of the woods. Wait a minute, I said as Dimitri prepared to enter the woods. I walked over to the familiar fallen log on the ground and flipped it on its side so the small branch pointed upwards. Now we can go. We made our way through the familiar portions of the woods. Before long, we reached the portion where suburban sprawl had claimed most of the trees. A portion of the woods stopped short and were replaced by an open field of tall wheat grass. Developers had cut down the trees to make a clearing, but had never gotten around to building houses. This will work. Dimitri said. We cleared out some of the wheat grass and placed the pole spike into the earth, pounding it with our feet until the pole stood rigid and immovable. Okay, we have two minutes until takeoff, as it were. Remember, even though we're going back to somewhere our brains are familiar with, we still might feel the temp uh, time sickness. Don't worry about that. We'll head back to this clearing and then we'll walk around the woods a bit, maybe even head to the playground to observe whoever is there. Understood? Yes, I said. Good. The path we'll take has already been well trodden by us. The machine will be waiting for us when we get back to the clearing. This whole thing will take 20 minutes, and when it's done, we will be the first two human beings to ever travel through time. Damn, it's about time. Grab the pole. I grabbed the pole, and Dimitri did the same. Dimitri flipped open a panel on the machine that I had not seen before. He pushed the button, and suddenly, wind was rushing at my face. Travelling through time wasn't inherently unpleasant, but it was weird. It felt as though a cold hairdryer was blowing directly into my eyes. As I squinted, I could make out flashes of colour but little else. My hand held firm on the machine, and it felt sturdy, as did the ground beneath my feet. It suddenly occurred to me that I never asked Dimitri how long this process would take, but before I could ask, the rushing stopped, and I was directly in front of a tree. The clearing was no longer a clearing. That portion of the woods hadn't been demolished yet, it was darker now in the shade of the trees, but I felt the midsummer humidity on my skin all the same. We did it, I said, unsure if it was a question or a statement. We did it, Dimitri said. My stomach immediately lurched with unease and excitement. I was somewhere the universe didn't want me. I was a time astronaut. Well, let's look around a bit. I remember most of the details of our map. The deer skull should be a few hundred yards that way, he said. He wouldn't even stop to let me catch my bearings. Dimitri was steadfast in making the physical journey through the woods. I knew how he thought. It was not enough for him to travel to the past. He needed to do his own moonwalk. We made our way through the woods, and I felt pang after pang of nostalgia. These were the woods. These were our woods. I hadn't been in them in years, but our makeshift map still lived on in my mind. It was beautiful. We saw notable landmarks like the blue bungee cord we once tied around a tree to see if it made it easier to climb. It did not. We saw the deer skull, and I've never been so thrilled to see the remains of a dead animal. As we saw each relic of the past, my heart beat even harder with the enormity of what we had done. Dimitri seemed to be enjoying himself even, usually all purpose and strategy. I could see something suspiciously like happiness in his eyes. He proposed 
that he head towards the edge of the woods so we could see if anyone was at the park. Before long, we had arrived to the entrance of the woods and I noticed the first sign that something was wrong. I thought you said I was at home watching TV and you were at soccer, I said. You are, or were, rather, and I was, Dimitri replied. Then why is the flag up? Dimitri looked down to see where I was pointing. The messenger log was on its side. Flag pointed straight up to the heavens. Huh, one of us might not have put it back down in 07, Dimitri said. I always turned the log over when I was out of the woods, I said. Well, I forget sometimes. I'm kind of forgetful, Dimitri said. Dimitri was not forgetful. Are you sure you had the date right? I'm positive, Dimitri said, sounding a little annoyed. Let's continue. We might get sick if we stay in one place for too long. I already was starting to feel a little sick, truth be told. The air was much hotter than I anticipated. This was many years in the past, before the ozone had been further degraded. Had it always been this hot back in the day? I felt feverish. The sweat uncommonly cool on my forehead. From our spot at the edge of the woods, I could see the swings and the slide that made up the playground in the distance. It was usually emptied when we arrived, and I expected it to be this time. But... Wait a minute. Is someone on the swings? I said. There was the form of a child sitting on a swing, his back to us. Suddenly, the air felt even hotter and even stickier. Sweat was dripping onto my eyes now. Hastily, I wiped it away. Looks like it, Dimitri said. Who do you think it is? I stepped out of the woods and closer to the park, leaving Dimitri behind. Something looked so familiar, yet distorted. The swing was swaying slightly back and forth, and the figure that sat upon it wore a hoodie with a hood drawn out. It was dark, navy blue. Dimitri, that's my hoodie. That's me. Are you sure? He said. But I could barely hear him, as I had already walked even further out into the woods towards the little swing set. I usually left that hoodie in Dimitri's basement, which tended to get cold during our game nights. Why was I out here, alone, on such a warm day? I drew closer to the boy in the swing, his back still to me. He didn't appear to even realize that someone had emerged from the woods and was now treading upon the soggy wood chips of the park. I'd never considered what kind of message I'd want to deliver to my younger self if I had the chance. Maybe I would tell him to play soccer like Dimitri, or be sure to stay in touch once Dimitri left town, or to choose a college major that wouldn't force me to move back in with my parents. I had to tell him something, and I had to tell him now. I was being drawn to him through no effort of my own like a time moth to a time flame. I was right behind me now, and yet still, the boy in front of me made no acknowledgement of my presence. Perhaps he, I, had headphones on. I maneuvered to the front of the swing. The boy didn't look up. I kneeled down so I could see into my own eyes and thought of what message I'd deliver. As I did, the boy pulled his hood back, and I saw dark hair and dark eyes. It was Dimitri. Pain exploded in my temple. It felt like an anchor was pulling my frontal lobe apart from the rest. Instinctively, my hands flew up to my face, and I felt myself collapse into the wood chips. I could feel a fever spread throughout my body. I didn't want to open my eyes to see the little preteen paradox before me, and even if I wanted to, I couldn't. The weak sunlight trickling through the canopy 
was suddenly blinding to me. I felt the UV rays pulsing even behind my closed lids. You were right. He reacted just like you did the first time, the young Dimitri said. I could hear the sounds of someone else stomping upon the park grounds. Told you, old Dimitri said, as I faintly sensed him stepping over my body on the forest ground, closer to his younger doppelganger. What time do you have? old Dimitri asked. It's 2.22pm, Eastern Daylight Time, young Dimitri said. Good. He'll be here in what, five minutes? Correct. Good. Their words sounded like they were coming from a dream to me. I could barely make sense of them. I could barely make sense of anything over the pain and disorientation. I held my hands to my face, desperately trying to make my eyes close farther. Make them close harder. You've got the right idea. Don't open your eyes for a bit, old Dimitri said, then added to his younger self, help me move him. I felt two pairs of hands grab my legs, and then my body was slowly dragged across dirt, twigs, and leaves. I could feel myself being dragged across the grass and eventually into the woods. They propped me up against the tree. I felt feverish. Snot dripped down from my nose, but I couldn't muster the strength to wipe it away. I thought for a moment that Dimitri would pull a bungee cord off a tree to restrain me, but he didn't have to. I was too sick to move. So what the hell was that upturned log about Dimitri? I heard the older Dimitri ask the younger. You know he wouldn't have come into the woods if the stupid flag wasn't up. The younger Dimitri responded. He's still on pace to get her at 2.30, right? Yes, I'll get back to the playground. I heard the little Dimitri stomp loudly through the woods. Through my limited vision, I saw the larger Dimitri shape advance towards me. I tried to get up, but I was so weak. Hey man, I owe you an explanation, Dimitri said. Well, I guess I don't really owe you one, but I'll give you one anyway. What? What's happening? I mumbled. So, for starters, you're time sick. I figured that would happen. Happened to me on the first few trips back. Familiarity is good when you're time traveling, but if you get a nasty shock like that, like seeing the younger version of someone you knew, your brain will... Pew, he said his hands mimicking a mushroom cloud around his skull. Few, first few trips back. Dimitri sighed, then began. On May 5th, 2007, a man suddenly appeared while I was in the woods alone. At first I was frightened, but then I realized he looked just like me. He was me. After he had gotten over his time sickness, he stood up and told me that in two weeks time, I would build the world's first time machine. He gave me the schematics from memory and told me what materials to get. In exactly two weeks, I had built that time machine. The exact time machine that we took back today. The man told me that I should begin studying the various paradoxes associated with time travel before I started. Thing is, Time travel isn't that hard to pull off. I mean, I did it when I was 12. The real challenge of all of this is testing the limits of it, figuring out what the time stream will let you do. He said I'd be ready to begin traveling in 2009, and so I was. Dimitri was smiling again. I'd now seen him smile more times on this trip alone than I did in all the summer days past. I was now starting to realize why he didn't smile more. He looked demented and ravenous. I killed my first deer in the fall of 2011. I shot an arrow into its skull and then brought the carcass back to 2007. The first step of my paradox studies were to see if anything would change. More importantly, I wanted to see if time would let me if it would let the same organic being 
exist twice, simultaneously in two different states of living. It did. That wasn't a good argument for the soul, I guess. The next year, I brought some neighborhood dog back to 2007 and shot it there. The original 2007 dog continued on with its life, undisturbed, until it met me in 2012, of course. I've been running paradox experiments like that for quite a while now, and all the other Dimitris in my timeline have been helping. They don't seem to have a hard time with it. I now felt mercifully close to being able to stand up. Still, I felt helpless in Dimitri's thrall. I didn't care about his paradoxes. I want to go home, I said. I'm sorry. Obviously, that's not going to happen, he said. He then reached out and pressed both of my shoulders gently, but firmly enough to push my weak frame back down onto the rough bark. Young Dimitri told young you to meet him here in the woods at 2.30pm. You were always a punctual kid, so you should be here in two minutes. Then young Dimitri will guide you into the woods and will kill you. The fog in my brain lifted and I felt my bone marrow turn to ice. Dimitri's dark eyes were flashing now. His arms still pinned me down. I shivered. He continued to talk but I could barely understand what he was saying. You're the final paradox. What happens to you when we kill you? Will you disappear? Will you carry on? It requires experimentation. Dimitri removed one hand from my shoulder to cover my eyes. This is going to happen fast. Close your eyes again. You'll feel better. I was freezing in the woods now. Or maybe I was just freezing. I could barely sense the hand over my face, or my own sense of fear over my teeth chattering. Relax, shh, relax, Dimitri said. I just need to take a look at you. I need to see what it looks like when... Wait, I cried, mustering up the last of my strength. How did you do it? How did I do what? Dimitri muttered, his hands still over my eyes. How did you kill me back in 2007? I mean, how is Dimitri going to do it now? How am I going to die? Suddenly, I could see again, and was vaguely aware that there was no more pressure on my shoulders. Once my eyes had adjusted to the light, I saw Dimitri sitting back on his feet, a blank expression on his face. I, uh, I didn't, he said. I haven't killed you yet. The plan was always to wait for the future, then take you back, and my younger self would kill you. But I don't remember my younger self. I mean, me when I was... I don't remember. Oh God, Demetrius' head exploded. The sound was quick and dull like a baseball bat cracking open a watermelon. All I saw was red. Then, I felt disgustingly warm viscera covering my face like a soggy mask. I opened my mouth to scream, expecting to taste blood, but instead, tasted nothing. I was at my kitchen table again. The neurons in my brain were telling me that someone had just knocked on the door. Not rang the doorbell, but knocked. I got up from the table, moved to the foyer, and opened the door. No one was there. <laughs>